You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Shruti Rajagopalan of the State University of New York's Purchase College. Shruti, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Hi, Garrett. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. So today we'll be talking about Trudy's work on constitutional political economy as it relates to India. We'll start by looking at some big picture concepts, and then we'll zoom in on specific case studies illustrating these concepts. So Trudy, let's start by talking about the Indian constitution. India got its independence in 1947 and ratified a constitution shortly thereafter in 1949. What are the important features listeners should know about if they're going to understand your work? So the Indian constitution is really a product of the time that it was written in and the uh, socio-political context that it emerged out of. Because of the colonial past uh, and because there was already some kind of representation for Indian uh, Indians in the legislature became a parliamentary system, At the same time, it borrowed heavily from the American Constitution uh, in terms of having a section of written down Bill of Rights. It's a chapter in the Constitution called the Fundamental Rights Chapter. It also borrowed uh, more heavily from the American Constitution in terms of separation of powers. The Indian government has judicial review, which is a much stronger version than what the parliament system in Britain allows for. And finally, India was a federal nation. It was actually a union of states and provinces that came together um, after the British left and India got independence. But it was never the sort of federal state that the United States Constitution was, in the sense that the union government or the federal government had very strong powers and the states had very few. In terms of the other most uh, important economic issue, which is fiscal federalism, Uh, India was relatively weak at the beginning of the constitution. All powers of revenue raising and distribution were heavily controlled by the federal parliament. So that is sort of the rough structural aspect of it. In terms of other aspects, it was a very well-represented constitutional assembly. It had about 15 women. The chairman of the drafting committee was uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, a very, very prominent Dalit leader, which is uh, representing the untouchables. Uh, He was educated at Columbia University and the London School of Economics. He had a doctorate in both law and in economics. It had uh, leaders from various provinces. A number of the members were elected leaders from the state legislatures. So it was a very well uh, carved out group uh, from the melting pot that was India in 1946-47. Uh, The major thing being that halfway, about a few months into the constitutional process, uh, the Muslim League split off and uh, went to Pakistan, and the rest of the members uh, drafted this particular constitution. So a lot of their cultural values reflect in it. The most important aspect of that cultural or ideological value is that most of them were socialists with a very heavy Fabian socialism influence thanks to the strong connections of Indians with the London School of Economics and the Fabian Society. So in addition to the Bill of Rights being written down, the Indian Constitution also has a separate chapter which is full of positive rights, such as guaranteeing a minimum wage, having commitments by uh, the states for redistribution of wealth, um, for welfare of women and children, and so on and so forth. So it's very much a product of its time. Right. So the... American constitution coming out of the late 18th century, you know, right around the same time that Adam Smith is writing The Wealth of Nations, and you have this whole Enlightenment mentality. It's a, it's also a product of its time, and it ha- is full of negative rights, uh, you know, the right, the kind of rights that protect you from being interfered with, but not positive rights, which sort of come more out of a a later intellectual tradition, positive rights being, you know, rights to things, to, uh, to things that need to be not just by the absence of someone doing something bad to you, but by someone actually giving you something good. Exactly. I would very much agree with that analogy that just like 
the American constitution was born out of the ideas of Locke and Smith. The Indian constitution was born out of the, some of the ideas of Madison and Locke and Smith, but also very much from the ideas of uh, George Bernard Shaw, Harold Lasky, and so on. Mm. So uh, one thing I, I learned while researching for this podcast is that the Indian constitution is the world's longest constitution. And something in your work, you've talked about the amendment process and how just how frequently the Indian constitution is amended. And you've discussed in your work some of the, the mechanisms and the, and the ways that uh, these amendments come about. So um, using that topic of, of the sort of socialist uh, and Fabian socialist background of, of this constitution, how, how did that l contribute to this, to just how frequently the constitution of India is amended? So, like I mentioned, the Indian constitutional framers were both inspired by British ideas, American ideas, and Fabian and socialist ideas. It became quite uh, contradictory and incongruous in certain parts. So what I mean by that is that there were very strong negative rights and simultaneously very strong positive rights. And sometimes in the process of enforcing positive rights, one ends up violating negative rights like equal protection under the law or uh, the right to private property and so on. So this conflict uh, became very apparent almost immediately after the constitution was ratified. So I'll give you an example to illustrate, which also led to the First Amendment. So the Indian population at the time was about uh, almost entirely agrarian, and 1% of the agrarian society held almost all of the land, and 99% were mostly landless peasants and tenants and so on. So there was sort of an agrarian land reform revolution already brewing against the old feudal system. So India inherited a dual feudal system, one which was uh, very local to each state and region, and the second was the overlapping laws of taxation that the British colonial government imposed. So it was sort of feudalism squared, and uh, the peasants were not in a very good position at the time. But they were 99% of the electorate, so they were actually most of the votes that parliamentarians were going to receive in the first general election. So one of the most important campaign promises was land reform done, uh, you know, the way that land reform took place in the Soviet Union or in China. You take large feudal estates, you break them up into smaller pieces and you redistribute them amongst the tenants or the peasants whose families have been working on that land for generations. Now, in theory, this sounds great. It may even have sounded like the most fair and uh, important equal egalitarian option at the time. But one of the major roadblocks in the process was the very strong Bill of Rights component, which was heavily inspired by the American Constitution. There were two parts to this. The first part was the eminent domain clause, which was quite Madisonian in the original Indian Constitution. Uh, the idea being that one must only take land for a public purpose. And, you know, there was a lot of debate and they agreed that this was a public purpose. But the second part, that it, the original property owners must be justly compensated. Now, a newly formed republic with an almost bankrupt treasury uh, could not possibly justly compensate the existing landlords and arist aristocrats. So what they ended up doing was they just wanted to take the land without giving fair market value compensation, because otherwise it sort of defeats the point, right? If you're trying to play Robin Hood, it doesn't make sense if you actually compensate the landowners. So the first part of this land reform program ran afoul with the eminent domain clause. The second part of it ran afoul with the equal protection clause, which is essentially this kind of land reform tried, uh, attempted to treat the rich landlords differently from the poor or medium-sized landlords. So if you took land from a very rich landlord, you would pay them only 1 20th of the compensation as the mid-sized or the poor landowner. So this again ran afoul with the Bill of Rights. So while this was going on, parliamentarians essentially debated a few different options. Uh, there was a very strong cry to entirely remove the right to property and equal protection from the Bill of Rights that is just deleted wholesale. Some felt that what must be done is abandon the land reform agenda, but that wasn't very politically viable. 
There was a third group that felt that all this must be removed from the purview of judicial review because it's the judiciary which is stopping this program of land reform by enforcing the Bill of Rights. So there were all these different ideas brewing and what they decided to do was essentially amend the Constitution. And in the very first amendment, and this sort of sets uh, the precedent for the following, you know, maybe 40 other amendments after that, they set up a dual system in the first amendment, uh, just on, in this particular question, on this particular question. So the first part was they diluted the eminent domain clause a little bit and built in exceptions to different kinds of estates and their sizes. And the second part was, should a particular land reform program run afoul with something like equal protection or some other strong uh, rights that we intend to protect, but just not in this instance, they created a new list. And uh, the list was in the ninth schedule or the ninth appendix of the constitution. So it was called the ninth schedule list. And what the First Amendment said was any law that is added to this list is completely protected from judicial review, even if it viol violates the Bill of Rights. So anytime you wanted to get around strong constitutional constraints, you could amend the Constitution and add that provision to what is called the Ninth Schedule. So the original contradiction between this sort of strong negative rights versus positive rights or you know, negative rights versus uh, planning, central planning socialist agenda immediately started creating problems. The contradictions became very apparent. And each time there was a choice between these competing ideas, the constitutional constraints lost and the socialist program won, at least for the first few decades. Right. So the, the ninth schedule is essentially, you know, it, it's almost a repeal of the whole rest of the constitution because it's a way for unconstitutional laws to be constitutional to totally removing the teeth from uh from from everything else in the constitution which is a pretty uh pretty scary thing but i guess it goes to show that if you're trying to pre-commit to something which i mean a constitution is kind of a pre-commitment to not pass certain laws you know, you, you really have to know that you can't pre-commit to something so strong that you won't be able to follow up on it. And it, it sort of uh, may, maybe shows a little bit of lack of planning. But do, do you think that India would just be better off if there had never been such a ninth schedule, if they had stuck to judi judicial review and just not passed unconstitutional laws? So let me answer the address the first part of your question. So the ninth schedule only circumvents the Bill of Rights, not the rest of the Constitution, in the sense that you still need the Parliament to vote on it and all the other structural issues that come with lawmaking. So they really only violate the Bill of Rights, which is bad enough, but it's not the entire Constitution. So that's one part. The other part is, I think it's a little bit complicated in the sense that it's very clear that there was a deep conundrum that the parliamentarians of the time faced. Now, most of the Indian population was not able to read and write English at the time of independence. They weren't very familiar with Madisonian ideas or John Locke's ideas or even socialist ideas, for that matter of fact, in terms of legal constitutional structure. What they really wanted was the unfairness and the oppression of the colonial masters and the feudal masters to go away. And unlike the American constitution, the Indian constitution introduced Indian adult suffrage right from the beginning. So everybody, every caste, every gender, everybody over the age of 18 was allowed to vote right from the beginning. So what that essentially does is it creates a system where the elite ideas at the time, which actually drafted the constitution, and the demands of the voters are completely at odds with each other. So what the Indian parliamentarians at the time were terrified of was a sort of a Soviet style or a Chinese style revolution. So they said, if we don't accommodate the land reform agenda, there will be a complete revolt against the entire constitution. And we don't want that because we want to be a proper constitutional republic. And there are lots of good, important constraints here to protect individuals. So the only way out is to circumvent one provision or one small set of rights 
so that we preserve the larger cause. At least this is how the debates play out in Parliament, and it feels like there is this deep conundrum. And the First Amendment, incidentally, was passed by the same group that actually ratified the Constitution. So they were sort of strangling their very own baby uh, in one sense. So I can imagine that it was it was a complicated situation without too many options. So I'm not so ready to just jump and say it was a very bad idea and, you know, it shouldn't have happened at all. Now, having said that, I will say that they could have had better safeguards. They could have used this as a one-time bazooka provision just for land reform and never allowed it again. However, that's not what happened. They didn't impose any limits on the ninth schedule. They left it wide open. And Nehru, in, uh, Nehru, who was the first prime minister of India, just said, oh, we don't need these constraints, like which parliament will uh, sort of compromise its own constitution. It's absolutely not required. So what the ninth schedule said was any law that needs to be added to the ninth schedule must be part of a constitutional amendment, which has a slightly higher majority than any regular bill that's passed in parliament. So that was one set of issues. But one single constitutional amendment can have infinite number of laws added to the ninth schedule, which means that through one constitutional amendment, you can have as many exceptions to the Bill of Rights as you wish. There was no other limit on the content. They didn't say only land reform law should be allowed, right? So even in using this kind of a weird provision, they could have used it as a one-time emergency situation, but that's not what happened. They just left it wide open. Until 1995, there were laws being added to the ninth schedule, which had absolutely nothing to do with land reform. So you have a paper titled Repairing Unconstitutionality, Evidence from India. It's a working paper, and it looks at this process of amending uh, the Constitution through the ninth schedule and how interest groups have, have used that for rent-seeking purposes. Do you want to tell me what that paper's about? Absolutely. So starting, I got this idea when I was looking at the ninth schedule. Usually when we're looking at the area of constitutional political economy or public choice, there's a very big analytical distinction between the rules of the game and the strategies that one uses within the fixed rules of the game. So economists like to take the rules of the game as given and then analyze the strategies once we know what the rules are. However, when you analyze constitutions, of course, constitutions are rules that are sort of fixed mostly, but they also change from time to time. So how do you try and understand a constitutional amendment process if you always take the rules of the game as fixed, right? So this was sort of the analytical gap I was trying to fill that we've neatly separated ourselves into constitutional economics and public choice. One just deals with how the rules are formed. The other just deals with strategies within the rules. But if you look at it just that way, constitutional amendments can't be explained. They're like unicorns. They just come out of nowhere. So if we really want to understand constitutional political economy, we need to understand how individuals, entrepreneurs, interest groups navigate these two levels, right? So unlike musical chairs where we press pause to the music and then everyone scrambles, takes their chairs, then we stop the entire process and then we play again, that's not how constitutional amendments are made. They happen while the normal legislative process is taking place. So now if we can accept that, then the next step from there is it is possible that one of the strategies that public choice scholars study of individuals or political entrepreneurs or interest groups operating in a particular political economy is not just extracting rents within a given set of rules, but one of their strategies may be actively to change the rules. And what are the circumstances in which they actively change the rules? It is when the benefit of changing the rules is really important to the rents or transfers that they are seeking. So I decided to look at this entire complex political economy process by just picking up the ninth schedule because that simplifies this complex area a lot. Because what the ninth schedule gives us is it, we can just look at one legislation at a time which led to constitutional amendment solely for the purpose of removing the constraint, right? So in the United States, 
the first 10 amendments actually add constraints to the constitution. So not all constitutional amendments are removing constraints or opportunistic interest group behavior. Some can just actually strengthen constitutions. So I only wanted to look at those where interest groups are trying to circumvent the constitution. And in this particular case, I realized that the ninth schedule was set up to protect legislation that violated the Bill of Rights and ran afoul with judicial review. So how do we look at constitutional amendments now? We look at it from the point of view of interest groups attempting to repair the unconstitutionality imposed on their agenda by a certain set of strong constitutional constraints. Right. So uh, although the word repair sounds like a good thing, what it really is, well, we, we might think that a constitutional constraint that prevents rent seeking, rent seeking being generally a, a negative sum sort of way that people compete to transfer wealth from other people to themselves, we'd probably see that as a feature. But from their perspective, since it's stopping them from accruing uh, wealth and, and rent seeking successfully, it's a bug and so it needs to be repaired. Just uh, from a sort of social planner, social optimum perspective, we'd rather these things not get repaired. Absolutely. So repair might be a good word, but repairing unconstitutionality is not such a positive thing in the sense that certain things are unconstitutional because constitutional constitutions attempt to constrain this kind of rent-seeking behavior. So if you're attempting to repair that problem, it's not such a positive outcome. Now, if you think of constitutional amendments as interest groups trying to remove constraints, right, or repair whatever problem they have run into in terms of the constitution, then a few things emerge. The first being that interest groups actually try to change constitutional rules to proceed with their own agenda. So the first implication of that is rules are not that fixed. You know, they can be changed and they will be changed when the benefit exceeds the cost. The second part of it, the way I structured it in this paper, is that there are various different ways of amending constitutions. The first is you can actually have a formal amendment in the legislature. In the United States, it's the Congress. In India, it's the Parliament. Or you can actually have marginal changes which are sneaked in by interpretation by the judges. So an interest group could try to get its agenda through if it ran afoul with a particular constitutional provision by trying to cajole judges into reinterpreting it in their favor or by trying to cajole uh, legislatures into rewriting the provision. So how do they do it? They choose between these two foras uh, the way they would choose between any other thing, which is what are the relative costs and benefits of each fora. And if it's actually easier to amend the constitution formally in the legislature, then that's the way you go. If it's very difficult to amend the constitution formally in the legislature, you might turn to judges and lobby for a favorable interpretation. So this paper actually looks at repairing unconstitutionality or interest groups trying to change constitutional rules at the margin, not just as a formal amendment process, but also as uh, includes the informal process of interpreting and reinterpreting rules and therefore changing the constitution. Right. So the, the interpreting thing is familiar, especially from uh, United States politics. The U.S. doesn't amend its constitution very often because it requires uh, two-thirds of the states to agree. But, right. uh, yeah. but yeah, you know, if you just look at things in, in recent years, like uh, states having bans on gay marriage went from constitutional to unconstitutional, not because there was an amendment, but because there, the Supreme Court reinterpreted some parts of it. And that's basically been how many things have gone from constitutional to unconstitutional or vice versa in the United States context. Exactly. And the kind of provision we had in India, which is, you know, a strong uh, eminent domain clause, which was formally amended in the parliament so that we can take land from one private party and give it to another private party. That has happened informally in the United States. The very same clause through Kilo, now the judiciary agrees that the word uh, public purpose 
includes public use, public purpose includes taking land from one private person and giving it to another private person in that particular instance for economic development. So what India ended up with through formal amendment, the United States ended up with through judicial interpretation. And if you think about that from the point of view of an economist, it's just relative price. It was It's easier to secure such uh, an informal interpretive amendment in the U.S. compared to a formal process, which, as you mentioned, is very arduous and extensive and expensive. And in India, it's relatively easier to have a constitutional amendment, a formal constitutional amendment. And therefore, perhaps the judiciary came down much harder and it was cheaper for the interest groups to go lobby parliament. So can you tell me about some of these specific cases of specific interest groups getting their way either through judicial interpretation or constitutional amendments? Absolutely. So I've categorized all the nine schedule laws into uh, wealth transfers and rent seeking uh, sort of, you know, uh, sorry, seeking wealth transfers versus seeking rents. So there were a number of provisions there which were land reform, so which were just direct wealth transfers from one group to another group. There were other cases of price and quantity controls. And with price and quantity controls, the incumbent firms benefit the most. Similarly, because no new licenses were going to be issued. So there was actually a big push from the Indian business lobby to limit price and quantity because they would get the most rents from that kind of limitation. Similarly, with restricting competition and monopolies, the incumbents benefited the most because it would prevent or raise the cost for new entrants to enter the market. So they were another lobby that strongly protected that kind of rents. Now, in India, there's a very unique interest group when it comes to constitutional amendments. And that interest group is state legislatures. So state legislators are actually not involved in the constitution amending process, especially when it comes to the Bill of Rights. They only need to ratify very few amendments when it comes to separation of powers and federalism. But other than that, the rest of the constitution amendment process does not require the states to ratify. So anytime there is a wealth transfer involved, which is sort of, you know, the land reform, Robin Hood kind of wealth transfer, whether it is uh, nationalizing banks or nationalizing mines or anything that is, you know, really considered a community or a national resource that they believe a few capitalists have captured uh, or in the First Amendment case land. It was actually the state legislatures that formed the lobby and lobbied parliament to change the laws because their major benefit was that they were going to get votes from lots of people by promising these changes whereas the cost will be borne by the taxpayer and everyone in the economy. And most of the cost will be borne specifically by those few rich capitalists whose property was being taken. So a very large interest group that emerged in the 50s and 60s in India was actually people who were standing for elections in the state legislature and the state assemblies. Hmm. So it's not always just the the big companies doing the rent seeking it's sometimes just local politicians who would we we have often a lot ta- to gain mm-hmm. we often talk in public choice about you know how you can get political power by redistributing from groups that are dispersed or not well politically organized to other groups who are concentrated and well politically organized and politically powerful it sounds like the local politicians did not have the power to basically to redistribute in ways such that they could give money to the people who they needed votes from and take money from the people who they didn't need votes from. It sounds like they didn't have this power without some kind of constitutional change. Exactly. So it depends on the kind of constitutional amendment. So there are some amendments which clearly favor a small group of businessmen. Right. And there you can make much more direct links with the standard public choice narrative of there is a monopolist or a small cartel that is chasing these rents by protecting their particular business or creating barriers to entry. In this particular instance, because there are also a lot of wealth transfers, 
involved, we must look at people who benefit the most from those wealth transfers. So right now, there is a raging battle regarding the ninth schedule in India. And let me just build you some context for that. So India, due to its horrific past of caste oppression, in the constitution built in a bunch of affirmative action provisions, uh, mostly to give some kind of benefit to historically oppressed castes, including Dalits who were historically untouchables. So to, you know, give greater opportunity to these groups and also to correct the horrors of the past, there were these provisions that were built in. Now, as you can imagine, different castes started forming groups and organizing themselves and started having their own elected leaders. And these elected leaders started promising certain special benefits to those caste groups. Now, one of the benefits that is allowed and promised under the Indian constitution is a certain number of reserved position in government jobs and a certain number of reserved positions in academic institutions. So if there are 100 admissions seats uh, to a medical college, then a certain proportion will be just for these oppressed groups, historically oppressed groups, and the rest will be in a general category. Now, there are two things that are simultaneously going on. The first is, as you can imagine, more and more groups started lobbying that they must be protected as a historically oppressed group, right? So the list that started out small with maybe 20 or 25 castes and tribes has now become much longer. So that's one part of groups lobbying to enter. The other part of it was there was so much of uh, so many uh, positions in government and in these educational institutions which were being promised to various caste groups that the matter eventually went to the Supreme Court of India in the 1990s and the Supreme Court said it's true that the Constitution allows this kind of affirmative action. However, we must limit all the affirmative action positions to 49.5% of the total positions. That is, you can't have more affirmative action seats than general seats or more affirmative action jobs than general jobs. So there was a sort of new constraint that was read in by the Supreme Court that 50% is the maximum number of reserved seats that you can promise. So now this created a conundrum for various caste groups. If new caste groups try to get these protections, then old caste groups will suffer, right? Because their proportion of that 49% goes down. So the new caste groups attempted to break the 50% ceiling by exceeding it. And one way to do that is the ninth schedule, because the ninth schedule protects any law from violating the Bill of Rights, even if the judiciary has declared it unconstitutional. So right now, the big battle, if you read the newspapers in India every week, one of the state legislatures has passed a law which allows the caste reservation or affirmative action to go past the 50% limit. And it has done so knowing that it is unconstitutional. And after passing these laws, they are currently lobbying parliament to change the constitution. So laws are being passed in India explicitly knowing that it is unconstitutional. And then it is the state legislators who have already accepted money or votes or bribes or favors from these caste groups who are lobbying the federal parliament that you must now allow these kind of provisions, even though they're unconstitutional. Okay, so there's this affirmative action system, and it gives certain percentages, university seats, 10% to this group, 10% to that group. And what you're saying is that those percentages of affirmative action seats that are reserved for different groups, there's now this constitutional law saying that they can't be a majority. And Exactly. Okay. And and then since as a you know, if you're in a politician at a local government of some kind issuing affirmative action seats to some group that is important electorally whose votes you want is a good way to win elections and so they want to be able to give out more than a major they want to be able to give out a majority of seats more than 49.5 percent so they're now fighting for constitutional exceptions through the 
the night schedule. Exactly. So you have summarized that beautifully. So initially there was no constraint, then a 50% constraint was added. And now these groups uh, represented very well by state legislators are trying to violate that constitutional constraint and repairing unconstitutional legislation that they have already passed. So this is sort of the last part of that particular paper that we're discussing, which talks about all the affirmative action laws which are currently passed or pending in any of the state legislatures where the legislators, knowing that this is unconstitutional, are pushing the legislation through, hoping that then they can change the constitution to allow it, which seems to be an upside down way of doing things. Mm -hmm. But it becomes a normal part of the political process because the constitutional political economy allows for these kinds of exceptions. Interesting. So I think we can uh, we can move on from this topic and talk about some of your specific case studies in Indian law. For instance, you, you wrote a, a paper about the Bhopal gas leak, uh, which was a sort of natural disaster or, you know, man-made disaster. And you have a paper discussing the way the, the sort of legal response to it. And I understand it was quite the fiasco. So how does this tie into the sort of understanding of Indian law and potentially dysfunctional parts of Indian law that we've been talking about? So in the first few decades, India was a mixed economy with a very strong central planning component. So in that sense, both private law and private business suffered. And by private law, I mean contract law and the law of torts where private individuals are contesting or battles or disputes in a court of law through which new legal rules emerge. Now, in this context, there was a horrific man-made disaster, which was a gas leak of methyl isocyanide, a extremely dangerous fatal gas, which leaked from one of the fertilizer factories owned by Union Carbide. So this particular chemical was stored quite carelessly by the management bang in the middle of the city of Bhopal in an extremely populated area because of a very careless and reckless behavior of the management. The gas leaked and overnight about 3,000 people died. And over the next few years, about 100,000 people have died because of the toxic nature of this gas. Wow. Now, yeah, it was just one of the worst things that has happened in terms of an industrial disaster and it's been compared to uh, Chernobyl and, you know, those kind of global industrial disasters. You and I are probably too young to know of this as it had happened. So we just read about it in history books. But if you look at newspapers, both Indian and international at the time, this was a very large scale and quite a big human tragedy, which was recognized worldwide. Now, one of the responses, immediate responses to the gas leak was American ambulance chasers just descended on the city of Bhopal. They started going to all the victims and engaging in all kinds of contracts to represent the victims and sue Union Carbide in court for damages. And, you know, those ambulance chasers came to India, they came back to the United States, and there were hundreds of lawsuits filed across different jurisdictions against Union Carbide in the U.S., so this was quite a big legal mess in the making in addition to the human tragedy. So there were two things that were happening simultaneously. One, judges in the United States figured out that all these lawsuits must be consolidated into a class action lawsuit, as is normally the case with, you know, asbestos and lead litigation or any kind of toxic industrial litigation. So all the lawsuits were consolidated and the first step that Judge Keenan in New York had to understand or decide upon was whether the legal petition would play out in the United States or whether it would play out in India. So oddly enough, Union Carbide strongly lobbied that the case must be decided in India, representing the Indian citizen. And ironically, the Indian federal government argued that the case must play out in the United States because the Indian tort law system is quite weak and underdeveloped. Finally, Judge Keenan decided that 
It's a vast number of Indian citizens who are affected and they cannot be effectively represented in the United States. So the case went back to India. As soon as the case went back to India, in the midst of all the legal confusion, especially because there was fear at one point that this may take place in the United States, the Indian parliament passed a law saying that the only legal representation for any Bhopal gas leak victim will be provided by the Indian federal government. So if I'm a victim of the gas leak, I cannot engage my own lawyer. I will be represented by the Attorney General of India, essentially. So it took away a very important right, the right to represent oneself in a court of law or to hire representation and represent oneself, uh, to represent oneself in a court of law. And the government was going to represent all the victims. Now, when this particular law was passed, it was applauded both in India and across the world. Because frankly, the protection that this law was hoping to provide was from ambulance chasers who generally have a really bad reputation. They come and they try to make money off of someone else's misery or someone else's uh, tragedy and loss. So American lawyers were frowned upon in general and in particular in this case. Also, there was a strong nationalist sentiment that this was an American-created tragedy because Union Carbide was an American company. And now Americans are profiting from the mess that they created. So that was a second sentiment. And the third issue was these poor gas leak victims, they're in the hospital, they are dealing with loss and health problems and uh, loss of employment, loss of their homes. So they can't possibly be in a good state of mind to understand all the legal issues. And there is a great fear that these American lawyers will defraud these poor litigants or charge very high contingent fees, sometimes ranging from 33% to 50%. So it was a very well-regarded decision that the government of India was so proactive and eliminated this entire mess. And, you know, Indians were not going to have representation from some minor lawyer who was, you know, chasing after these cases, the Indian victims would be represented by the Attorney General of India and his office, which is one of the finest legal representations money can buy. And overall, this was regarded as a very good decision. Now, having said that, it had a whole number of unintended consequences, as one would expect when you look at it from the economic point of view, and when you think of the incentives that this law put in place. Now, when we think of ambulance chasers and when we think of people who represent victims without charging an upfront fees, but only charging contingent fees, that is, they don't charge by the hour or they don't charge when they take the case on, they usually charge only when the victim gets a favorable decision and they take a portion of the damages or the benefits awarded to the victim. So let's say I'm a gas leak victim and I get awarded a million dollars. I would have to pay nothing until I'm awarded the million dollars. And at that point, depending on what contingency fees arrangement I have entered into with the particular lawyer, it would be $300,000 or $500,000. So basically, I would part with a portion of my uh, damages. On the other hand, if I don't get awarded anything, I don't have to pay the lawyer anything. So you can imagine that as an economist, unsavory as ambulance chasers might be, they're an extremely incentive-compatible arrangement between the litigant and the lawyer. The lawyer gets paid only if the litigant wins, and the lawyer does not get paid if the litigant does not win. On the other hand, if you think of something like the Attorney General of India, whose incentives are not aligned with that of the victims, but whose incentives are that of a bureaucrat, then you start revealing or understanding or untangling the mess that took place in Bhopal. Today, it has been 33 years. The, the Bhopal gas tragedy anniversary is celebrated every year. There is a huge protest that victims have still not been paid their money. And the reason for this is that the attorney general's office just didn't have its incentives aligned with that of the victims because they weren't getting a share of the pie. They miscalculated the number of affected victims almost tenfold. They settled too quickly. They got too little money out of the settlement. And at some point, they weren't able to tell the difference between the fraudulent claims and the genuine claims. 
So even though the government of India got the settlement, it has not distributed it amongst victims because it has no filtering mechanism. So now, if you think, if you rethink this Bhopal gas law from the economist lens, you can see what an incentive incompatible mess it made in that in terms of quality, individuals got excellent representation. But in terms of incentives, because the incentives of the lawyers weren't aligned with that of the victims, the victims neither got justice nor received damages. So there are a whole lot of things that went wrong in this case. First, there's the issue of weak Indian tort law and trying to, there's this debate in public choice about, you know, do you, do you regulate things in advance to stop bad things and externalities from happening? Or do you have some sort of system of torts where if someone is harmed, then they go to court and they get a payout and that creates an incentive not to harm people? And it sounds like India went heavily into the first strategy, the regulation strategy, and heavily away from the tort law, private law sort of strategy. So that's one issue when you have a big one-time event like this that regulation failed to prevent after the fact what ideally you'd have a tort system that could deal with it, but the tort system was not so good. And then and then just this issue of, uh, of the incentives not being aligned of, of putting people in charge who basically get you know their regular bureaucrat salary regardless of the outcome unlike an ambulance chaser or private lawyer who gets a percentage of of the payout there is a fourth aspect to this uh, if you don't mind i'd like to get into it which is related to the third aspect of the incentives of the bureaucrat versus the private lawyer and when you think of the incentives of the bureaucrat versus the private lawyer in an individual sense, that is, in the sense of did the individual get individual victim get paid or not, you can understand the incentive compatibility versus the incompatibility. But there's a larger systemic issue coming out of it. Now, one of the biggest problems that has taken place in Bhopal over the last, say, 30 odd years since the settlement was received. So the settlement was received in 1989, 1990. So it's been about 27 years. Now, one would think that 27 years is enough time for the government of India to figure out the genuine victims from the fake victims and actually give them the damages that they are supposed to receive. Having said that, it's not a question of time. It's a question of knowledge and information. And the second problem of having a bureaucrat in charge, as opposed to having the decentralized ambulance chaser system play out, is that the bureaucrat has no knowledge. He's kind of like a central planner who has no information on the genuine versus the spurious claims. Whereas if this had played out in a tort system, ambulance chasers provide an additional service, in addition to being incentive compatible, of filtering cases. Their incentive is only to take the genuine cases because otherwise they end up spending time on a case, but they don't get paid, mm. right? So they are likely to be the first step of filtering between genuine cases versus those who are just producing fake paperwork. Now, we didn't have that. Second is, in a dispute resolution system, which is competitive, that is, you know, the ambulance chasers represent their victims, you know, corporate lawyers represent Union Carbide, you would have a competitive system where each side will poke holes in the other one's story. So then you have a second filtering mechanism where Union Carbide's lawyers would say, oh, these are not genuine cases or these are fake cases. Mm -hmm. The Attorney General of India's office doesn't benefit from either of these filtering steps and therefore doesn't generate the information required to know who the genuine victims are. This is the reason they got the headcount so terribly, terribly wrong. What they thought was about 3,000 fatalities is now supposed to be almost 100,000 fatalities. So they didn't get it wrong by 5 or 10%. They got it wrong a few, you know, 30, 40-fold. And we're still not sure which, which estimate is correct. So there is that last part, which is in addition to generating the appropriate incentives for the victim, this kind of competitive incentive-compatible system also generates the appropriate information system-wide, making things more efficient. Okay, so so in a normal class action suit, you might make a deal that says, 
or you know come to a resolution that says Union Carbide has to pay a certain amount to each victim or you know maybe proportional to how badly they were harmed or something like that. But in this case, it sounds like they came to a conclusion that had Union Carbide paying out a fixed lump sum amount that yes. the attorney general would then distribute without exactly uh, without that distribution so the, process being really planned. Exactly. So the attorney general's office came up with a number of $470 million. They had some basic, you know, way, arithmetic of how many deaths, how many uh, injuries of various degrees, how much money needed to go into the ecological cleanup because the toxic gas has now entered the groundwater system and so on and so forth. Now, if those initial numbers are wrong, naturally, the settlement amount is terribly off. So first of all, there is very wide consensus that $470 million was a fraction of the damages that should have been demanded and settled upon. So there's, you know, some people, the generous opinion is the attorney general's office was busy, incompetent, and this was not a priority. The not so generous version is that they were corrupt and there were side deals made with Union Carbide where, uh, you know, they took a cut of the money and just settled for a lower amount. Now, either could be possible, but let's go with the generous interpretation. So they got the initial numbers wrong because they didn't have the advantage of that filtering mechanism that ambulance chasers and a competitive judicial process provides. So if your original arithmetic is wrong, the final number is completely wrong. So they settled too soon and they settled for too little. And even once they settled, they had no idea how to distribute the money. Uh, more than half the money uh, is still left undistributed. It's just sitting in an account in the Federal Bank of India, in the Reserve Bank of India, collecting interest. Hmm. Do you have any concluding thoughts? I know we've talked about a few different issues. We talked about the Indian Constitution. We talked about rent-seeking and constitutional amendments. And then we went specific talking about the Bhopal gas leak and, and uh, as a specific example of the failure of the Indian system. Uh, how, how Would you like to tie it all together for us? Is there a general lesson to take from all of this? I would say there are a couple of uh, ways to think about this kind of uh, research and case studies. So I think the standard way of just looking at individual incentives or individual agents is not helpful for these kinds of problems. For these kinds of problems, we need to first of all look at the rules of the game, which has now become more and more prominent in mainstream economics, right? Institutions matter, rules matter. This is something that's widely recognized. The second part that I would add to this, which is still a little underemphasized in economics, is that the system that generates the rules also matters a lot. So it is not just about whether we should have a property rule or a liability rule that is going to save the Bhopal situation. You also need to understand what is the system that generates that rule? What is the system that enforces that rule? And how does that structure play out? So let's say you have an excellent judiciary with very well-trained judges, and then you have parliamentarians who will just circumvent that system by imposing something like the ninth schedule, then the rule really doesn't matter very much, right? It doesn't matter how your eminent domain clause is written or interpreted if there is a structural imbalance between the powers of the judiciary and the powers of the parliament. The same thing plays itself out in uh, the Bhopal gas case. So I think from the economist's point of view, a lot more emphasis on the structures that actually lead to the emergence of particular rules should really be studied. I think the second aspect that emerges from this is the importance of ideology. Because if we think about the process of rule creation or emergence of rules, a very strong component is culture and ideology. So what is the current context in which these rules emerge? Like I mentioned with the Bhopal case, there was so much nationalist fervor and so much anger against American lawyers and American companies that led to a particular rule being imposed and a terrible outcome as a consequence of that particular rule. Uh, similarly, if you think of the Ninth Schedule, it is a product of the socialist vision of that time. 
of wanting mass land reform programs, which essentially would do this kind of, you know, Soviet-like, you know, re reclassification of the country or the economy in terms of property ownership. So that also comes from a particular kind of ideology. So it doesn't matter if you studied Madison's eminent domain clause, and if you tweaked it and you incorporated it in the constitution, if the ideology of the parliamentarians and that of the voters is completely different from that. So I would say that this, what I'm trying to do is contribute to the rules literature by adding two more pillars or elements to that. The first is structure and the second is ideology. Hmm. That's a very interesting project and I, I hope it goes well. My guest today has been Shruti Rajagopalan. Shruti, thanks for being part of Economics Detected Radio. Thank you so much, Garrett. I really enjoy speaking with you. Uh, good luck with the future podcast. The discussion question for this week's episode relates to constitutional law and something I said early in the conversation. The question is, when writing a constitution, how much allowance should you make for that constitution to change? Do you agree with the American approach that had a constitution that was very difficult to change, required two-thirds of state legislatures to agree, which is very hard to achieve? Or do you agree more with the Indian approach that makes the Constitution very easy to change? Or do you think there's some happy medium in the middle? Where does that medium lie? So if you want to contribute to the discussion and answer that question, then head over to Facebook and go to the Economics Detective Facebook group. So that's Economics Detective and request to join, and then you can contribute to the conversation. There will be a thread, the link to this episode, and the discussion question at the top. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Thanks, and I'll be back next week.